Hello and welcome to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Glad that you could join us once again. In this segment, going to have a conversation with Dr. Rebecca Craig. She's a dean of the College of Health Sciences at, Ar- at Arcadia University, and she's joining us on the program to talk about a study uh, that was recently published in which she is a, a co-PI that looked at the effects of home-based physical therapy on elderly hip fracture patients. Welcome to the program, Dr. Rebecca Craig. How are you? I am fine, and thank you so much for the invitation. I did, of course, mention that you are the Dean of uh, College of Health Sciences at Arcadia. Let's talk about this study. Okay. Um, I'm a physical therapist. I was the chair of the physical therapy department here at Arcadia for about 20 years um, and have been the dean for five years. So my background is in physical therapy, and I began working with hip fracture patients in the mid-80s. Now, when you say working with hip fracture patients, are we talking about uh, fractures that are caused in accidents? Are we talking about older patients, younger patients? Who specifically are we talking about? Yeah, the population that we look at, and I should say patients with hip fracture, I shouldn't say hip fracture patients. So patients with hip fracture that we look at um, are the older adults. And older just in this study was 60 years, which is not ancient, all right? So but an older adult who sustained a fracture, um, not the younger population. And certainly we know that there are younger individuals who go skiing and break a hip, but this is different. Now, are we talking uh, fractures that are uh, injuries, or are we talking fractures due to uh, some type of uh, a bone um, density issue? <laughs> it's probably both. Um, certainly with an older adult, there's an increased tendency to fall. And in some cases, certainly we know that in many older individuals, the bone becomes thinner. And so when you fall, especially if you're a thinner person, you break more easily. The bones break more easily. So, you know, whether the thin bone led to the fracture or the fall led to the fracture is a question that lots of people are looking at. I do understand that the study is uh, focusing on home-based therapies. How many people are we talking about a year, not necessarily in the study, but a year that are, are dealing with a, a fracture that are 60 years or older? Well, that's a wonderful question to ask. Uh, across the world, it's estimated there are going to be four and a half million Um, by 2050. Right now, we're talking about probably around 300,000 per year that have a hip fracture uh, who are 60 years of age or older. And what's amazing is it's just a broken bone. So I'm sure many of your listeners and you may have had a broken bone. It's not a big deal in the younger population. In the older population, fracturing your hip is often the beginning of really a significant decline in health status. We've all heard the, uh, at some point in our lives, heard the, you know, you're going to break a hip, you know, referring to someone who's old and maybe wanting to do some things that maybe they shouldn't be doing because of their age. Is growing older kind of a a guarantee? You you mentioned some (laughs) staggering numbers uh, of people who are going to be dealing with it. Is Is it a guarantee or are there steps that we can take to prevent well, that's that's one. Of course, we need to be more active. It's very difficult to listen to any sort of health news recently and not hear about exercise. And there's lots of evidence to indicate that exercise in the older adult really improves quality of life, makes stronger bones, allows them to walk, keeps them healthy. So, so I think the the concept of prevention is really important. I don't think that. It's a guarantee that when you're an older adult, you're going to fracture your hip. Um, I think the more active we can remain, the better we're going to be. So um, I have this hip fracture and I'm in the hospital for, I don't know, maybe a couple, three days, but then I'm going <laughs> home. Um, right. You mentioned that the, the breaking of a hip is the beginning of a serious decline in, in lifestyle, mobility, um, all kinds of things. I'm at home. Yeah. Um, how many of the folks at home are getting the, I guess, the therapy? You talk about being active yeah. at home. You know, you're home, you're trying to nurse a yeah. hip, you're older, maybe you're by yourself. How does that, yeah. how does that play in? Well, um, there's certainly, if you have the right insurance, um, you get home care, and home care usually includes a nurse coming out 
and a physical therapist. Uh, other times there may be an occupational therapist is included as well. Um, and the, that coverage usually lasts the, during the first month that you're home. Um, but then that that coverage stops. And I think what we were interested in finding out is if we went longer, if we provided exercise intervention for a longer period of time, could we dramatically improve the person's ability to return to the community? And what did you find out? And I can tell you that both groups got better. Both groups got better as a result of extended care at home or improved care at home or a combination of the two. Oh, that's a wonderful question. Um, I think when we look to other studies um, and um, the control group, uh, mm-hmm. meaning the older adult who's had a hip fracture who just gets usual care, doesn't get an extra intervention, our both of our groups look better. But again, we can't do cause and effect because maybe it was just natural recovery. You know, the research always makes us be very careful in making claims. Um, So I can say that in both of the groups that were treated, there were a percentage that were able to return to the community walking, which meant for us that they could walk a certain distance in six minutes. Um, uh, And they had um, increased strength and increased range of motion. So there were improvements in a lot of the measures that lead to improved function. Was there any consideration for live-in training caregivers caregivers, uh, to to help and not necessarily having an outside person come in? That's a really wonderful question. One of the things we were interested in doing was having a physical therapist guide the patient in the intervention at home. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, um, people are sent home with a list of exercises on a piece of paper. Um, And there are some people who are remarkably motivated and able to do the exercises, but not necessarily well. So our interest was seeing whether supervised physical therapy would lead to better outcomes, because some of the other studies have not used the physical therapist in the home. So that was one of the very particular questions that we were asking. And I think even if we project telemedicine, there's an opportunity for the physical therapist to to beam in to the home to make sure that the patients are doing the exercise correctly, that they're helping the caregiver ensure that the quality of the exercise is good. In your experience, from what what you've seen, what were some of the psychological uh, aspects oh. of this added help, this more hands-on exchange, I guess? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Um, we did not look directly at the impact that the physical therapist had. Um, we, we measured resilience in the patients. We looked at depression. Um, there were no significant changes in those. So I can't really, again, speak directly. I can tell you that the physical therapist really enjoyed the relationship with the patients and the, a lot of the patients looked forward to seeing the physical therapist come to the home, but we don't have data to say, and yes, this was the right thing to do. You know, it's, it's been a pleasure talking with you this morning, Dr. Craig. Um, thank you for joining us here on Health Professional oh. Radio. Uh, is there a website where our listeners can get some more information about this study that you're aware of? Go to the Journal of the American Medical Association. It, it's on their site. Well, once again, thank you for taking the time this morning. Thank you so much. We'll talk again. All right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Transcripts and audio of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, listen in, download at SoundCloud, and be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com health professional radio.